Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Okay, what's the first effect of fusing your act into the divine will? Where the wedding takes place. All together? A wedding takes place. A new wedding. Very good. A new wedding. If you do 100 acts of fusion in one day, how many? New weddings. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very good. <laughs> and the second effect, new a new baptism. A new baptism. Is the new baptism the same as sacramental baptism? No. no. Come on. Yes. No. No. Why is it not the same as sacramental baptism? Because Jesus takes away the tendencies of passion. Thank you, Jim. It does remove passion and some Thank you, Richard. Sacramental baptism takes away the effects of original sin. It doesn't take away the human tendencies uh, to and weaknesses that tempt you to sin. The other word for that is called concupiscence. In other words, your human flesh and human will are still operative. So the baptism of the divine will. <coughs> which happens in every act you fuse into the Is divine the will, which you fuse into the divine will, removes <coughs> all tendencies towards sin and destroys concupiscence. Why? Because the answer is always the same, because Jesus lives in you. Excuse me, in that act. And Jesus does not have concupiscence or the tendency to sin. <clears throat> so if you do your prevenient act, <clears throat> And you let do not do any actual acts of fusion during the day. <clears throat> You're leaving yourself wide open <clears throat> to be tempted, because in the garden of paradise, the terrestrial paradise, Jesus calls it, the reason Satan was able to enter was because Jesus said to the weasel when she asked him, how come <coughs> Satan could enter when Adam and Eve were living in the divine will? Good question. He said he stopped loving them. What does that mean? <coughs> he didn't do his The only act acts Jesus, uh, Adam and Eve were asked to do were the acts of creation. <clears throat> they didn't need to do acts of redemption or sanctification, there was no need. And they started to get slack in doing their rounds and their, <clears throat> their I love you's, putting their I love you, I thank you, I praise you on every created thing which was God's gift to them. And it's like human relationships. 
if you stop being grateful to the one you love, if you stop expressing your gratitude to that person, eventually <clears throat> that union becomes weaker. You see? That's why this I love you, I thank you, I praise you is so necessary, especially to our beloved God. But in our case, we're asked not just to do the rounds of creation, but the rounds of redemption and sanctification. And this is what we do when we fuse our acts. Now, one lady said here, of Sophia, that she uses the different language and, it, it, and as far as she understands, it's still the same. You don't have to use the word fuse. You can say, I fuse myself. Fusion, the word fuse is used often in the Book of Heaven. But you can say what other people have taught you. Come divine will and reign in me in this act. Right? In other words, <coughs> excuse me, as long as you're inviting the divine will <clears throat> to come and reign in that act, you're fusing that act into uh, Jesus. And Jesus incarnates himself. <clears throat> there is one <coughs> lesson where Louisa asked him, she said, really, is this really happening, Jesus? Um, you incarnated in this act. Isn't it more just a mystical thing that's happening? And he was very strong in his response. He said, no, 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 Louisa. It is incarnation, not union. <clears throat> I had hoped today to go into the difference between the, those four spiritual states, but I know I won't get time. But it is incarnation of Jesus occurring in every act fused into him. So now we go to the third effect. If you forgive me, I have to sit down for this. <coughs> And I'm losing my voice. A new, a new light of divine knowledge <clears throat> is infused into the soul. <clears throat> Why is that? Because when you invite Jesus to inhabit your soul, the first thing he wants to happen to you is for you to know himself. <clears throat> Gospel of John, eternal life <clears throat> is this, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. <clears throat> Gospel of John, eternal life is this, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ. What's some honey in that sweet? Would you like some honey in that sweetheart? I, I, yeah. Or one of these? Yeah. yeah. That's good. Thank you very much. There so much for my coordination. <laughs> Have another one standing by. Yeah, we <laughs> Um, <clears throat> knowledge of God, to know God, is to love him more. So the first thing Jesus does is infuse more knowledge into you about himself when you invite him into that act. <clears throat> so I'm going to read to you a few of our Lord's own words. Um, is James here? Yeah. 
Where are you, James? It's funny. It's funny. Yeah. Oh, there he is. Could you please read that for me? Because, because um, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> my little daughter, this child is the image of your soul. Timid in receiving the light and the knowledges of my divine will. But I will drown you with so much light so that you lose the residue of the timidness of the human will. Because in mine there are not these weaknesses, but divine courage and strength, insurmountable and invincible. In order to form the kingdom of my fiat in the soul, I extend in her as foundation all the knowledges of him, and then I take possession, extending therein my life itself in order to have my kingdom. You must know that our love is so great that when we decide to give a word, to manifest a truth from our Supreme Majesty, we also provide the act in which to do it enclosing in ourselves the good which that truth has to produce. When the good we have to give to creatures, through those truths we manifest, is all mature and completed, <coughs> then we give this good to one of them, and she becomes the bearer of that good for the benefit of all human generations. Therefore, our words enclose all centuries, and being words of life, they possess a creative strength. Wherever they reach out, they will create life and bring the goodness of our truth. So, stopping our words by not manifesting them means stopping all the good and lives that our words can produce. <coughs> I know, my daughter, that you would never want to give me such a sorrow by preventing this great good from reaching the human generations. I mean, would you? One who loves me cannot refuse me anything, not even the sacrifice of her own life. Therefore, be attentive, since you don't want to be responsible for so many of our divine lives, which are destined to give life to creatures. So, so, this infusion of divine light, which the light is the knowledge of God, that's what it is, is what happens when you fuse an act, your human act, into the divine will. Because Jesus is incarnated in that act. And who is Jesus? The eternal word. And the word wants to be made flesh. Now how can the word be made flesh if not through you? Do you see so the word wants always to be made flesh. But then he instructs Louisa as he has instructed me that when I infuse these knowledges into you, you must speak them. Because if you don't, you're contracepting the seed of these knowledges. And this is why the sin of contraception in generating human life is a very great sin. But it flows out of <clears throat> the contraception of the Word of God. To just live in your human acts without fusing them into the divine will, you are preventing the conception of Jesus' divine life in humanity. 
and Jesus calls it in the upper volumes an abortion of the divine life. So in the lower volumes you won't find these strong words. As you get to the upper volumes you begin to discover the contraception of the word is preventing the eternal word, Jesus, from conceiving his knowledges of God into human creatures. So, <clears throat> can you read that last bit, please? Yeah. So, stopping our words by not manifesting them means stopping all the good and lives that our words can produce. I know, my daughter, that you would never want to give me such a sorrow by preventing this great good from reaching the human generations. Now, would you? One who loves me cannot refuse me anything, not even the sacrifice of her own life. Therefore, be attentive, since you don't want to be responsible for so many of our divine lives, which are destined to give life to creatures. Thank you. And Louisa wanted to remain hidden and unknown, right? Because she didn't want the whole world to know this interior acts of love Jesus was doing in her. It was too embarrassing for her. And Jesus is saying to her, if she does that, she will be contracepting his life, which he wants to multiply, reaching the words here, preventing this great good from reaching the human generations. Now, if you decide to just live this life privately, and we do do that in the initial stages especially because we want to form these lives within ourselves, love Jesus, respond to Jesus. But we reach a certain stage where our desire to gift the incarnation of Jesus to others is so great. So this was the desire in our Blessed Mother when it says in the scripture, she made haste to go to Elizabeth's house to share the good news of the incarnation of Jesus in her soul. We feel that too, don't we? Someone said something to those effect. We want to share this good news, but it won't be received by souls who are still attached to their human will. So we know there is most souls are not going to be interested. But the way we reach all souls here, is Jesus telling us, is through these acts of fusion and our reciprocal love to Jesus for incarnating himself in us. And therefore these words of love we speak to him as our Blessed Mother did the moment he incarnated himself in her. She never stopped telling him how much she loved him on behalf of all generations. So now we go down to the next quote, which thankfully, are you okay yep. with doing it? Sure. Um, so May 17th, 1938, from volume 36. <clears throat> such is the soul and the body. There's such harmony, order and union that one cannot do without the other. The necessity for fusion of one's human acts into him. So be <coughs> attentive. I watch your steps, your words, the movements of your pupils your tiniest acts, in order for my will to have its life in its place. We don't care whether the act is natural or spiritual, big or small, but we watch attentively to see whether all is ours, whether our will may derive its sun of light, sanctity and love. 
We use even the most insignificant act to make the most prodigious wonders, forming the most beautiful scenes to keep us all amused. Didn't we form the marvellous enchantment of the whole creation from nothing? Wasn't it from nothing that we created so many harmonies up to our very image in the creation of man? My daughter, if creation had to give us only what is spiritual, that would have been very little. Instead, by giving us also its natural acts, it can always give. We can be in continuous relationship and our bond never breaks. More so, since the small things like breathing, moving, helping oneself in little personal things are always available and within reach. Available for the little and the great, for the ignorant and the learned, and they never end. If these little things are done to love us, they form in themselves the life of the divine will, our victory and triumph, the ultimate purpose of their creation. See then how easy it is to live in our will. The creature doesn't have to do new things, but just what she always does. That is to say, to live her life as we gave it, but in our will. Uh, yes. Isn't that beautiful? So you see, you don't have to be doing anything uniquely different to what you're already doing. So it's very important for you to understand this, that all these great and marvellous things, the incarnation of Jesus himself, what could be more marvellous than that? happen if I just say, oh Jesus, I love you breathing in my breathing. I thank you for my life. From my first breath I breathe to the last I shall breathe. And if I expand that round, you know, to love Jesus in every breath, in every creature, in every heartbeat, the continuous incarnation of Jesus takes place. Now, that's mind-boggling to the human mind, but there's a, the confirmation there, even in your, the pupil of your eye, the movement of your eye, which you're unconscious of most of the day, but if you make yourself conscious of these loving acts of your Creator, keeping you alive, able to see, able to hear, able to speak. What a gift speech is. Isn't it the greatest gift we can tell God we love? We were created to tell God we love him. That's why we were created. Now, God is not interested whether we have amazing intelligence and can recite all the greatest theologies and everything in the world. He just wants us to be little children telling God we love him all day, every day. And even before we go to bed at night, we put our entire sleep and heartbeat in his and say, even when I'm sleeping, Heavenly Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I want to be continually saying to you, I love you, I praise you, I bless you. It's very simple to live in the divine will. Now, when you do that, when you obey your Creator and you obey the eternal word speaking to you, what he does is incredible. He infuses all the knowledges of himself into you. Without you having to stress your little intellect, he infuses them into you. So continue, please, James. My good daughter, <clears throat> my love wants to be tied more and more to the creature. And the more truths it manifests regarding my will, the more bonds I put between God and herself. In manifesting the truth, my love is preparing the marriage between God and the soul. 
the more it manifests, the more pomp and magnificence this marriage will have. Would you like to know what happens then? My truths will be like the dowry needed in order to marry God, or to get to know the one who lowers himself and even ties himself only for love in the bond of marriage. My truths touch the creature over and over. They mould her to new life. They return her to the beauty of our image and resemblance from the time she was created and impress on her their kiss of inseparable union. Just one of our truths can make a sea of prodigies and divine creations in the soul who has the goodness to listen to it. One truth can turn a perverted world into a good and holy one, because it is one of our lives, exposed for the good of all. It is a new sun that we raise in created intellects, a sun that will let itself be known through its light and heat, turning into light and heat whoever wants to listen. Therefore, hiding a truth that we give from our paternal womb with so much love is the greatest crime. It deprives human generations of the greatest good. Further, one who lives in our will by marrying us makes a feast for all saints. All of them participate in this divine wedding and because of it, they have their own party in heaven and another one on earth. Each act the creature does is our will, in our will, is a feast, a table sumptuously decked for the heavenly regions. In return, the saints give new gifts. They beseech the Lord to manifest more truths to the soul, to broaden more and more the boundaries of the dowry which God gave to her. Thank you, James. So you see how beautiful and generous God is when you give him your will and all of your acts. So that's the third gift, the infusion of divine light in these knowledges in your soul, in each act, in each act. So the more you fuse your acts into him, the more knowledges you will receive of God himself. And it says here, even all the saints are appealing to God to infuse this soul with more and more and more knowledges because the more knowledges that are given to you, the more this marriage feast is celebrated in heaven. So you're the cause of joy for all of heaven. When you do this, obey Jesus and do this continuous fusion. So the next effect of fusing a single act into the divine will, a new divine life is born. Absolutely. When, when did I ever shut up? God's great desire to have the creature live in his will promising to fashion more divine lives than there are created things and acts of the creatures through these divine nuptials of God with the soul who lives in his will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reading from December 5th, 1938, volumes 36. You must know that from all eternity it has been established by our divinity that we will make as many divine lives as there are things that we've created. Since our being is greater than everything, it is only right for it to surpass in its lives the number of all created things and of all the acts of the human family. Now, if the creature doesn't live in our will, there is nothing we can do. We would lack the divine material to form our life in his acts. Are you hearing that? There's nothing God can do if you remain in your human acts. So the, the more human acts you leave outside of his will, he can't operate in them. He, 
This is the significant difference. He's always operating in every humanity. Everyone in the world could not live, could not breathe, could not act, could not walk, could not see, could not hear, unless God's will was giving them life. But in those persons that live their life without recognition of God, they're not allowing God to incarnate himself in their humanity and they're frustrating God. They're aborting his generative power. And only souls that give their fear to live in him and allow him to live in them can give him the generative power to generate himself in humanity. And that's the significant difference. He says we would lack the divine material to form our life in his acts. That's what happens when you don't fuse yourself. Jesus is still operating, but he's not receiving the reciprocal love. That's the nuptial bond. And only in that nuptial union can you generate divine life. <coughs> Just like a man cannot generate on his own without a woman. She conceives the life he has and gives birth to it. So I'm not sure if they've got the technology yet where they can do that. But anyway, <laughs> the thing is, it's the same divine principle in God. He cannot conceive and generate his divine life and give it birth unless you fuse your acts into him. So, <clears throat> We would lack a place where we can put it. And then to form these lives of ours without having anyone to want them, without having anyone to know and love them, what good would it do? So, consider what this most beautiful, powerful and wise act involves. It involves laying bare our lives, which we've already generated in our womb. But we cannot bring them forth because our will doesn't reign. And does it seem like a small thing to you what's lacking in this great work of creation? It is the most important act and the most striking feature in which creation and all other acts will be cloaked with a beauty so rare and a glory so great as to make the beauty they've known of us and the glory they've given us in the past look like so many little raindrops. My daughter, oh, how great is our longing, how we throb with love and tremble with desire to have the creature live in our will. And since we know he lacks many things to be able to serve us with his acts and to form our life, we are willing in our ongoing work to compensate in everything for what he's lacking. In every act of his, we will give him our love, our holiness, our goodness and beauty, so he will lack nothing that is needed to form our life. And thus, we will give birth to and reproduce ourselves. And oh, what a great exchange of love, of holiness and of goodness we will have. Thus, his acts will rise from within our acts because everything that is done in our will leaves neither us nor our very acts. Thus, he will always love us and we will always feel loved. He will keep growing in holiness, goodness and beauty. With this, he will continually acquire new knowledge of his creator because he will feel the creator's vibrancy in his acts. My will will become a revealer. It will keep telling him new things about our divine being so he may have a greater appreciation of our life which he possesses. Thank you. So you can see the natural... Uh, relationship working here 
Jesus loves so much that you're gifting him your humanity in its nothingness, its inability to do anything good without him. He loves that so much that he wants to conceive his life in you but reveal to you more of his beauty, more of his knowledges, more of his life. And so without even doing anything to deserve it, you are growing in your knowledge of the interactive life of the Trinity. You won't need a theologian to explain it to you. You won't, because God wants to be known. Did you know that? God wants to be known. He's our Father, our Mother, our Beloved, our Saviour. And he's not going to withhold a single knowledge about himself from you as long as you do this act, this singular act of love, fusing yourself into him as often as you can. It'll come. Eventually you'll find yourself. It's nature to you to do it. In the beginning, you know, it's always a little bit more difficult. So let's go to the next effect of one single act done in the divine will. A new manifestation of the divine attributes takes place. Now the attributes of God are not his essence. His essence and substance is the divine will. The divine mercy is the greatest attribute of God. So the attributes of God flow out of his will, okay? But the will is always the superior origin of every good. Reading from October 17th, 1900 from volume 4. Yet a suffering soul and a most humble prayer make me lose all my strength and render me so weak as to let myself be bound by that soul as she pleases. And I said, Our Lord, in what an ugly appearance is justice showing herself? And Jesus added, She is not ugly. If you see her armed like this, it is because of men. But in herself, she is good and holy like my other attributes because there cannot be even a shadow of evil in me. It is true that her appearance seems harsh, piercing and bitter, but her fruits are sweet and delicious. So I want to explain this because we, all, we often see chastisements, as Jesus says here, as the ugly face of God, you know. God getting angry with human beings. In actual fact, the opposite is happening. The chastisement comes when God releases his divine mercy to allow the effects of human beings' sins to come back upon them. So the true origin of chastisements, which um, we think we... we it seems to us is divine justice at work, is God not, it's not God acting to punish, it's God lifting his merciful hand to allow us to experience the effects of our sins. And I, I, I explained this in a simple way the other day at the retreat when one of my children was fascinated with fire. You know how children are fascinated with fire. They, well, they always want to light matches, you know, that kind of thing. I, it just came into my mind, my youngest brother nearly burned down our whole house because he, he lit with matches the curtains, you know, on the, and, and my mother walked in, the whole bedroom was on fire. And because children are fascinated with fire, so I kept telling my son, now don't touch the stove, it, you, it'll burn you. Don't touch the stove, darling, it'll burn you. You know, after about the fifth or sixth, don't touch the stove, it'll burn you, he, stepped, he put his hand, he kept putting the hand back, you know. And so I eventually let him. 
I let him be burnt. Now that's what God does. He 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 for that sometimes he waits for thousands of years and then he says, I'm just going to let them experience the effects of their sin. That's what chastisement is. It's the human will chastising itself. It's not like God coming down with the heavy hand of punishment, although, you know, you can interpret it that way if you like. He's just allowing us to experience being burnt by our own behaviour so that we will understand how horrible our sin is. And that's what he's doing now in the world. And it's very, very important because he said, justice, Louisa, is actually a beautiful thing, God's justice, because everything in God is good. There's nothing bad in God. So next, uh, James, that little one there. November 14th, 1926, from volume 20. On the other hand, in the soul in whom my will reigns, my will disposes her to become suitable material so that our attributes may carry out their delightful crafting. Okay, so this is what happens in your acts, fused into the divine will. All the attributes of, of God carry out their delightful crafting in your soul. When you live in the sanctity of the virtues, there's a lot of your own personal striving involved to be holy, responding to sanctifying grace, etc. But there's, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's been my experience. It's more like you putting more human effort into remaining holy, you know, or in the holiness of God himself, because there's no holiness in us. And you want to give access to the virtues, but in the divine will it happens in a strangely different way. The virtues come to meet us because we've gifted our will, we've martyred our will. And so instead of striving for the virtues, they simply deposit themselves in us. And we find all of a sudden that we're able to be loving, obedient to people we would normally not find it easy to be loving and obedient to. And this is a kind of wonderful difference in this sanctity because Jesus is living in us with the Holy Spirit with his own virtue. It's a strange anomaly because you're so little and you're such a nothing, you can't do any good by yourself. So we move on to the next effect of one single act is an infusion of divine love is given. And this is so beautiful, I could read this lesson every single day of my life. So, James, you've got the privilege of reading it. August the 9th, 1937, from volume 35. <clears throat> my flight continues in the divine volition, and it awaits me with so much love, and it takes me in its arms of light, and it says to me, my daughter, I love you. I love you. And you tell me that you love me so that I may rest my great I love you upon your little I love you. And launching it into the immensity of my fiat, I may make everyone and everything love you. While you love me for everyone and everything. I am the immensity. And it pleases me to give to creatures and to receive from them my immense love. I give and receive the harmonies, the multiple notes, the sweetnesses and the enchanting and enrapturing sounds contained in my love. When my will loves, the heavens, the sun, the whole creation, the angels and the saints, all of them love together with me. They all stand at attention, 
waiting for the I love you of she to whom they had directed their I love you. And therefore, upon the wings of my will, I send to all your I love yous, as though to repay them for their loving you together with me. If one loves, it is because one wants to be loved in return. Not to be requited in love is the hardest pain that makes one delirious. It is the most transfixing nail which can be pulled out only by the medicine and the balm of requited love. Thank you, James. Now, is not that so? Is not that so that we love, especially parents loving their children and experiencing their children? rejecting them, moving away from them, denying them. The unrequited love is the sharpest, the deepest pain that we can suffer. So on a grand divine scale, imagine how, how the Father, Son and Holy Spirit feel when the majority of mankind are rejecting them. It's the cruelest pain that God suffers, the rejection of his own children, and when I experienced this myself, our Lord made me understand that I was sharing in his own pain of rejection and that it was a great blessing for me. You know, instead of looking at it as something terrible that I had to endure, now I understand it as a great gift because I can share in God's own pain of being rejected by his own children, not to mention our Blessed Mother, the blasphemies and the rejection against our Blessed Mother are so great that her statues are weeping blood all over the world because of the rejection of God. She never thinks about herself because the rejection of God by his own children and so if any of you have experienced any of this rejection in your own family, please welcome it as a great gift you're being given to share in the pain of Jesus. And if you bear it patiently, one day you will see your children return to the Father's house. That's his will. So this last reading about... Um, knowledge causes new love to arise is very, very important. So please read that, James. Reading from the 5th of December 1938, from volume 36. <coughs> it communicates other varieties of our beauty. It will be impatient to tell the creature new things, as though feeding him with what we are. The happy creature will feel caught in the net of our love. He will feel enveloped by our light and our captivating beauty. And we will be so taken by his love that we will take refuge in him in order to love and give vent to our love. We will adorn that creature in such a way as to make us experience the enchantment of so rare a beauty. Therefore, all other things are like raindrops compared to the creatures living in our will. So pay close attention. You will give me the greatest happiness and make me most content if you live in my will. And how do we live in God's will? <coughs> Thank you. Well, um, I want to hear it a lot more loudly than that. By fusing. By constant fusing. Thank you. By continual fusion. Because then, who lives in us? Jesus. 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 Continual fusion incarnates Jesus in our acts. So whatever acts you're doing, no matter how small, 
they still achieve all of this magnificent effects and they reach every human being and every created thing. So that's in heaven, in purgatory, on earth, from Adam and Eve to the last who shall live, from the very first thing that was created. And it's all come out of nothing, out of the will of our Father. So fusing your acts, no matter how small, remember, even in the blinking of your eyes, how many times do your eyes blink in one day? And you, you just say, I want to tell you, I want to tell you I love you in the blinking of my eyes, in every breath I breathe, in every step I take. You know, it's so beautiful, it's so simple. But you've got to understand what happens because after a while you start to say, like Louisa, she was sitting in her bed one day saying her I love you. She said, am I, am I doing any good here? Come on. Is this happening? Is this, <laughs> is this causing any good in the world? I'm sitting in my bed continually saying, I love you, I love you. And then, of course, that was just an opportunity for Jesus to tell her of the great effects of her I love you, which we just read. So now the, the next effect of a single act, don't forget this is one single act. What happens? An expansion of the field of divine operation in the soul and all creation. Let me explain to you a little bit what that means. The field of divine operation is your soul, right? Mm. So the more acts you do, this field expands. You know, it's a bit like um, thinking of my son. He likes to keep buying more land and more land. <laughs> The, the land, the field of divine operation expands in your soul according to the number of acts you do. And the more acts you do, the field of the divine operation expands. So God can do more and more things in humanity because of the more acts you fuse into him. So, James, let's read this, please. <coughs> December 30th, 1927, from volume 23. Now who has sowed it holds the right to gather. And being a divine field, I am proprietor of it, not only to gather, but to sow again. Hence, I am not doing other than to sow again. Don't you see how I am all intent to the work of casting seeds of light into this field? so that germinating, they bring forth the new sons of the knowledges on my will. No, notice that. When you're fusing your acts into him, the field of, of this divine light expands. But what does it do? The seeds that are sprouting, growing into a big, you know, plant or tree are knowledges knowledges of God himself. So people want to uh, make a misinterpretation of this. They think you have to have some kind of special intellect to be able to grasp these knowledges. You don't. You just have to do your constant fusion, obeying what Jesus is asking you to do, doing your rounds of creation, redemption and sanctification, <coughs> And he expands this view of his knowledges into you. And without realising it, these knowledges come to the surface just when you need them. And you, you're surprised. You go, how, how did I know that? I know that. You know, it's all inside of you because he's been sowing these knowledges in your soul. Even without your recognition he sows these knowledges in your soul and you surprise yourself when you come out with them 
So, thanks, James. My little daughter of my will, how beautiful it is to live in my will. As the soul enters it, she breathes with our breathing. She beats with our heartbeat and moves in our motion. In communion with all, she does what the angels, the saints and all created things do and makes everybody do what she is doing. How does she do that, James? By being fused, they're all one together. Yeah, how does she make everyone do what she's doing? Well, she's writing the book of heaven, so she's... Well, she's buying she's the book of heaven, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Someone it's said something up the back. Multiplies. Yeah, she's multiplying the divine lives which go out to all humanity. It's like they're knocking on the door of everyone's heart, letting me come in. You know that beautiful image of Jesus knocking on the door and saying, if you open the door from the inside, let me in. I'll share a feast with you. What's the feast? The knowledges, the knowledges. So I'll tell you about myself. I'll reveal myself to you. So all these divine lives that you are incarnating in your acts, you send them out to all humanity and to the soul that's disposed, they open the door and let him in. And without you even realising it, the bilocating power of your acts, Jesus bilocates for as many acts as you do. And you send him forth through all humanity and he says, then that soul who does that makes everyone do what she is doing. So the invitation to Jesus, to these souls, is to enter his fear. And so you're multiplying on earth those souls that are going to respond to the fear. So don't continue here. The wonders contained in our will are astonishing. The scenes are so touching and unique as to capture everybody, making all attentive in enjoying them. Who knows what they would do to enjoy as spectators such delightful scenes from this soul who lives in the divine will. Now you have to know that as the soul enters my divine will, she breathes, palpitates, and moves in our motion. But she does not lose her own breath, heartbeat, and motion, although it is never detached from ours. Since our will is everywhere and circulates more than the breathing, heartbeat, and motion of all, then what happens? The angels and the saints, our very divinity and the whole creation, together with my will, feel the breathing and the heartbeat of the creature within them. Oh, wow. What's happening in this room now? Yeah, I know. They all feel her moving inside, even to the centre of their souls. They are full of happiness, of new unspeakable joys, which the pilgrim soul brings to each blessed. Since this soul is not enjoying, but suffering and conquering with her free will, it is merely by breathing, palpitating and moving in the fullness of joy that the soul, always united to my will, brings ever new joys from breathing in her own will. Do you see how all of heaven and the saints, they feel your own breathing, palpitating inside of themselves? Why? Because Jesus, God, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, live in them, in heaven, right? So when you fuse your humanity into Jesus' humanity on earth, it's a suffering, you're a suffering humanity with Jesus. Usually there's more, of course, our life on earth is suffering and pain, deprivation, etc. But your heart is palpitating in the heart of Jesus. And because they live inside the heart of Jesus in heaven, they feel your palpitating heart 
in them in heaven. Have you ever thought of that? That your palpitations of your heart are felt in the saints' hearts in heaven? And they know who it is whose heart is palpitating. And this comes because you have fused your humanity, your heart, your breathing, your words, your works into Jesus. And it's inseparable from Jesus. And who reigns in heaven as king of all creation? Jesus, right? Adoring, loving the Father's will. So you, living in the divine will on earth, are also living in heaven. You are also living in heaven. Now, you don't feel it because you are a wayfarer on earth, suffering, just like Jesus and Mary, Joseph and Louisa suffered on earth. Every moment of their life was a suffering of deprivation because that was the reparation needed to sanctify humanity, to redeem humanity. But you're still in heaven in the divine version of yourself is still palpitating in heaven in Jesus' humanity, reigning in glory in heaven. And since it is the free will that forms the conquering act of the creature, she gives me this new conquering flavour. Oh, how happy the blessed, our own divinity and the whole creation remain. And in an emphasis of love and fullness of joy, they say, who is breathing, palpitating and moving in us? Who from the earth is bringing the conquering act of pure joys, of new love that we do not have in heaven and that makes us so happy, increasing in us our reciprocating love? And in all chorus they say, It is a soul who lives in the divine will on earth. What prodigies, what wonders, how enchanting the scenes, a breathing that breathes in all, even in its creator, that moves in all, even through heaven, in the stars, in the sun, in the air, in the wind and in the ocean. It takes everything in hand in its own motion and gives to God love and adoration, all that everyone should give but has never given. She gives to all her God, his love, his will, and she brings everything to God and God to everybody. Oh. So this is what you do when you are in a state of continual fusion. You bring God to everyone and you bring everything to God. Um, I'm just going to ask you, Jenny, when am I supposed to finish? Three o'clock. Three o'clock, it? so it's yeah, half... You've got 40 minutes. 40 minutes, you Okay. Yeah, I just see, I think there's only one more. Oh, no, the Jenny... You can finish different. early if you, if you need yeah. to. I, I won't... Um, I won't read those extra quotes on, on this particular one. I want to go to the generative virtue of the Father well, now, one. Michael, because <coughs> then there's only two more, two more effects. That's the generative virtue and the Trinity in souls. Yeah, and that's the full effects. Of course, it's only the shorthand version of what actually happens. So. Um, what was the one we just did again? Expansion of the field. Of the uh, thank you, thank you, darling. Uh, expansion of the field of divine operation, right? So you can equate that a little bit with families that have. Um, more and more children because of the love the spouses have for each other. That's an expansion of the field of the operation of their love for each other. Well, God wants to expand the field of his divine operation. What's his divine operation? 
the generative virtue. There's one single act the Father does for all eternity, and that act is to generate his Son. I'll say it again. There's one single act God the Father does for all eternity. He generates his Son. And since he generated his son, he generates his son in heaven for all eternity and wanted this virginal generation of his beloved son to multiply itself in Adam and Eve and that generative virtue was aborted by Adam and Eve. So after, after the... After Adam and Eve refused this virginal generation of divine life, they could only generate physically. And their first two sons, one became a murderer. So these are the effects of physical generation of life without the infusion of divine life and divine love. So what did you want to say, Helen? Um, what you just said, I was thinking about the word knowledge. Yeah. And when the angel asked Mary, she said, but I know no man. Yeah. So the intimacy between the virginal and the, and the human human generating or that the Yes. She, she meant she had no carnal knowledge. No carnal yes. Yeah. That's uh, what's helping me with understanding the word knowledges. Yes. Yeah. The intimacy, the virginal, the, the pure intimacy between the virginal and the virginal Yes. Yes. And these knowledges are generative. Yes. They're not like a thought. Or an or a intellectual knowledge. Yes, um, Richard. Um, Richard. She, well, Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He was begotten, not made. Yes. But how does the, the Father generate His Son? Could you expand that one a little well, bit? Well, that, that's our credo. He's begotten eternally yes. of the Father. He always existed. Yes. So. But he's eternally generated from the Father. The, fa the Father's one single act is to generate his beloved Son for all eternity. He's not generated like there was a time when he began to be generated and that he's been, he has been generated all eternity from the Father. The Father's love, the Holy Spirit, abides in the Father and his will the marriage of his will with his love generates the son, just like a husband and wife's love for one another generate their children. Because love itself, the nature of love is to generate itself. It's not static. It must generate itself. Love is a doing word, an act. And the one single act of God the Father is to generate his son because his son is his reflection of himself and his own spirit. There's one most extraordinarily beautiful reading where Jesus talks about we loved ourselves so much within ourselves that we couldn't help to generate creation and humanity outside of ourselves, but first we loved <coughs> ourselves within ourselves. And, and this is very perfectly um, imitated, you might say, in ordinary family life, is if a man and a woman truly love each other, then they're not um, living within themselves in a selfish love. They must generate that love outside of themselves to their own children and then to their own grandchildren and then to the community in which they live. 
because that's a reflection of how the Trinity themselves live. I don't know if that answered your question properly, Richard, because it's like that's the kind of big question. <laughs> It'll come to you one day. God, the Holy Spirit, will give you the answer. But this is, I love this subject because um, Christopher West said, who is a, a student, a master student of the theology of the body, and he's got videos now on YouTube which I encourage you to watch, but he also came into knowledge of the divine will many years ago, but he continues his exposition of the theology of the body. But um, I often quote him because he says, heaven, heaven is the recovery of the virginal value of man. You see, because Adam and Eve did not generate human lives, they generated divine lives before the fall. So it was their children, their divine lives they generated, that Jesus said pursued them after the fall to sustain their parents from dying from grief for the, the way, the guilt they felt after their great sin. That's in the book of heaven. These divine lives pursued their parents, Adam and Eve, to uplift them from dying from this great, tremendous grief. So the virginal generation of divine life existed in the Holy Family three virginal humanities who had more children, divine lives children, than any other humanities on earth after, before Louisa was conceived. So this virginal generation of divine life is critical to our understanding of how the Blessed Trinity generates life. And that's where we're re returning to. Because there's no marriage in heaven in that context, you know. So we're returning to the virginal generation of divine love, which is actually what I've been saying all day. What happens when you fuse a single act into the divine will? Thank you, my darling. You incarnate Jesus. That's the virginal generation of divine life. Who incarnates Jesus in you when you fuse your act into the divine will? Our Father. And? Holy Spirit. Yes. And? Mary. Thank you, Jenny. Go to the top of the class, Jenny. Because the divine will is this nuptial interaction between the Father's will and the Holy Spirit and the Immaculate Conception. That's what's happening in your act fused into, into the divine will. It's the nuptial act of the Immaculate Conception. You know, Our Lady identified herself, gave herself that title. I am the Immaculate Conception. She's the Immaculate Conception of divine life. And it's her nuptial fiat with the Father, and with the Holy Spirit that generates Jesus, that incarnates Jesus. So when you say, I fuse myself into your holy and divine will, that's the act you're entering. It's such an explosive act, I can't even put words to it. But it's this reciprocity of nuptial love between the Father's and the Holy Spirit and the Immaculate Conception, our Mother, that generates Jesus as many times as you fuse your acts into him. So now let's look at what this generative virtue is. This is from volume 33. 
And guess what? It's on March the 25th, which is the Feast of the Incarnation. The generative virtue of the Father is activated to incarnate his Son for as many acts as the soul fuses into him. Volume 33, March 25th, 1934. My daughter, all the acts of my humanity possess the generative virtue. Therefore, the mind thinks and generates holy thoughts. It thinks and generates light, knowledge, wisdom, divine cognitions, new truths. And while it generates, it pours like a torrent into the minds of creatures without ever ceasing to generate. So each creature has in her mind the receptacle of these children of mine, generated by my mind, with the difference that some keep them honoured, courted, and giving them the freedom to produce the good they possess, while others have them without caring for them and as though suffocated. Now this is so important. When you fail to recognise that every thought you're gifted with by God, because everything's generated in the mind of God, you're suffocating his children. Because the thoughts of God aren't just thoughts like we think of thoughts. They're his children. And he wants to give birth to his children through you. So when you do your prevenient act, you're saying you're giving to God the empty womb of your will so he can generate his thoughts in your mind, his breaths in your breathing, his acts in your act, his works in your works, his passion and his love in your passion and love for him and all your sufferings, the wounds, etc. That's what you're doing in your prevenient act. Now what he gives you is dependent on your dispositions to receive him. So if you don't have the right disposition, he's not going to give you, know, give you what he desires to give you. But if you just say your prevenient act and you go around just doing your own will for the rest of the day, you're, of course, aborting these divine lives that he wants to, uh, as he says he is suffocating them. And he actually feels the suffocation. You know, when he was on the cross and his whole lungs, because crucifixion affects the lungs and your capacity to breathe, that difficulty he had in breathing was the suffocation of all these divine lives. He felt that suffocation in the Garden of Gethsemane. He felt it throughout his entire life, even when he was in the womb of his mother. So it's so important for you to understand the, the, the critical importance of your fusion of your thoughts, your words, your everything you do, even the tiniest little thing you do. So thanks, James. My gazes generate gazes of love, of compassion, of tenderness and of mercy. I never lose sight of anyone. My gazes multiply for everyone. And, oh, the power of my gazes, with how much pity it pours over the human miseries. It is so great that in order to place them in safety, it encloses the creature in my pupil to keep her defended and surrounded with affection and unspeakable tenderness, such as to astound the whole of heaven. My tongue speaks and generates words that give life sublime teachings. It generates prayers. It speaks and generates wounds and arrows of love to give the generation of my ardent love to all and make myself loved by all. My hands generate works, wounds, nails, blood, embraces to constitute myself works of each one, a balm to soothe their wounds, nails to wound them and purge them, and blood to wash them, embraces to hug them and carry them in my arms 
as though in triumph. <coughs> the whole of my humanity generates continuously to reproduce it in each creature. Our divine love consists precisely in this, reproducing itself in all and in each one. And if we did not possess the generative virtue, this could not be a reality, but only a way of speaking, while we do deeds first, and if we use a speaking, it is to confirm the deeds. More so, since my humanity is inseparable from the divinity, which by nature possesses the generative virtue and remains over the creature like a mother with her arms opened, and generates her life in them in an admirable way. But do you know who receives the effects, the complete fruit of this continuous generating of mine? It's one in whom my will reigns, who not only receives the generation of my acts, but reproduces them in an admirable way. Okay, the admirable way of producing these divine lives is to learn how to do your rounds. So you start with simple acts of fusion and then you either learn them from someone else how to do them. I, I have a desire to um, uh, do a whole course on how to do your rounds spontaneously because it's in the rounds that you are in an admirable way generating these divine lives. So it's like anything else, you can just learn your two times tables and your mechanical ways of doing things first and that's important. I remember Pope uh, St John Paul II saying, uh, repetition is important in the beginning of anything. You know, as a musician, a mathematician, Whatever you're doing in learning a new language, you have to repeat, repeat, repeat. So in the beginning, you do it that way until it becomes a habit with you. And then you move into the next level and you keep going to a higher level. So then the rounds become a spontaneous part of your nature. And here it says here, it's in the nature of God to possess this generative virtue. And once he divinizes you, it will be your nature <coughs> to live this life. It will no longer be a struggle to you because Jesus living inside of you with the powerful love of the Holy Spirit will do it. Now what I want to do now is because I'm just checking. Yeah, okay, we can do this to James and then I'll get on to the final effect which is um, the formation of the Trinity in your soul. March 18th 1917 from volume 12. My daughter, my humanity on earth did nothing but connect each thought of creature with my own. So each thought of creature was reflected in my mind, each word in my voice each heartbeat in my heart, each action in my hands, each step in my feet, and so with all the rest. With this I offered divine reparations to the Father. Now, all that I did upon earth, I continue in heaven, and as the creatures think, their thoughts pour into my mind. As they look, I feel their glances in mine. Therefore, a continuous electricity flows between me and them, just as the members are in continuous communication with the head. And I say to the Father, My Father, I am not the only one who is praying and repairing, satisfying and appeasing you, but there are other creatures who do within me whatever I do. And even more, with their suffering, they make up for my humanity, which is glorious and incapable of suffering. By fusing herself in me, the soul repeats all that I did and continue to do. What will be the contentment of these souls who live their lives in me, 
embracing together with me all creatures and all reparations, when they will be with me in heaven. Amen. So the final effect of the soul is the formation of the Trinity in the soul. Now this happens with every act you fuse into the divine will. The formation of the Trinity in the soul, hence an exorcism of all that is evil. June 12th, 1913, from volume 11. Now, this union with me, part to part and mind to mind, heart to heart, etc., produces in you, in the highest degree, the life of my will and of my love. In this will, the Father is formed, and in this love, the Holy Spirit. And through the operating, the words, the works, the thoughts, and everything else that can come from this will and from this love, the Son is formed. And here is the Trinity in souls. So if we need to operate, it is indifferent whether we operate in the Trinity in heaven or in the Trinity within souls on earth. Did you hear that? <laughs> Now, I'm going to read it again to you because, really, you know, this is the height of generosity of God, how much he loves you. Now, this union with me, the reason I want to read it is because it doubles the love I feel for this. <laughs> and I get to hear it too. <laughs> now, this union with me, part to part, mind to mind, heart to heart, etc., produces in you, in the highest degree, the life of my will and my love. In this will, the Father is formed. And in this love, the Holy Spirit. And through the operating, the works, the words, the thoughts and everything else that can come from this will and from this love, the Son is formed. And here is the Trinity in souls. So, if we need to operate, it is indifferent whether we operate in the Trinity in heaven or in the Trinity within souls on earth. So you, that's in volume 11, June the 12th. Read it over and over. And now we're going to read, just see if I've got time to read um, the last section. Um, and then we'll have a break. That's pretty much a good one to read, I think. Or this one. Let's, yeah, let's read this one, James. Volume 18. So October 24th, 1925, from volume 18. So, the creation, the redemption, and the sanctification are one single act for the divinity. And only because it is one single act, it has the power to make all acts its own as if they were one alone. Now one who lives in my will possesses this single act. And it is no wonder that she takes part in the pains of my passion, as though in act. In this single act she finds, as though in act, her creator creating the creation. And forming one single act with her God, she creates together with him flowing as one single act in all created things and forming the glory of creation for her creator. Her love shines over all created things. She enjoys and takes pleasure in them. She loves them as things belonging to herself and to her God. In that single act, she has a note that echoes the whole of the divine operating 
And in her emphasis of love she says, What is yours is mine, and what is mine is yours. Be glory, honour and love to my Creator. In this single act she finds the redemption in act. She makes it all her own. She suffers my pains as if they were her own, and she flows within everything I did. In my prayers, in my pains, in my words, in everything. She has a note of reparation, of compassion, of love and of substitution for my life. In this single act she finds everything. She makes everything her own and places her requital of love everywhere. This is why the living in my will is the prodigy of prodigies. It is the enchantment of God and of all heaven, as they see the littleness of the creature flow in all the things of their creator. Like Solar Ray, bound to this single act, she diffuses everywhere and in every one. Therefore, I recommend to you, even at the cost of your life, Never go out of this single act of my will, that I may repeat in you, as though in act, the creation, the redemption, and the sanctification. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm. So, I'll just read to you briefly about the importance of fusion in Jesus' own words. <coughs> Do you think that it is trivial that fusing yourself in my will, you place the whole of this will of mine as though on your lap, which though it is one, brings its divinizing act to each creature, and reuniting all these acts of my will together, you bring them before the Supreme Majesty to requite them with your will together with mine, with your love, redoing all the acts opposite those of creatures, and you press this same my will of mine to surprise the creatures once again with more repeated acts that they may know it, receive it within themselves as prime act, that they may love it and fulfil this holy will in everything. And so the adoration of my wounds more than one does this act for me, but giving me back the rights of my will as the prime act which I did toward man, this no one does for me. Um, the, the prelude to this was Louisa was concerned that she had wasn't going to get time to do the adoration of his wounds. And Jesus is explaining to her the much more important act she can do is to fuse herself into his divine will. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is your duty to do it. That's the act of fusion. As you have a special mission about my will, and if sleep catches you while you're doing it, our Celestial Father will look at you with love in seeing you sleep in his arms, seeing his little daughter, who even while sleeping, holds on her lap all the acts of his will, to repair them, requite them in love, and to give to each act of our will the honour, the sovereignty, and the right that befits it. Therefore, first fulfil your duty and then, if you can, you will also do the adoration of my wounds. May Jesus be always thanked. Last night, what's that? By his goodness, I did both one and the other. So that was a lesson Louisa told, uh, Jesus told Louisa that her primary uh, duty was to fuse her acts in his will rather than follow her usual devotion. So I thank you for listening. And um, I just want to, at this uh, three o'clock hour, to say a little prayer 
of infusion into the passion of Jesus. And then I will hand back over to Jenny um, what she wants to tell you. O oh, eternal will of my Father that has given me life, beloved Jesus, my humanity was modelled on your own and now you're giving back to me the perfection of your own humanity in every act I fuse into your will. Most Holy Spirit of divine love, I want to enter into you to take all the generative power of your love to incarnate Jesus in every act of my life, to enter more deeply into him, to suffer in union with him, the passion of love that he continually suffered on earth within his humanity. I want to unite with the way that our beloved mother shared in these sufferings I want to put my I love you on all her maternal embellishments of love on every act that human beings have done. And I want to do with her and Jesus what they did to divinise every human act in the rounds of creation, redemption and sanctification. I ask this blessing for all of us here present and for everyone in humanity. <coughs> from Adam to the last who shall live, that your divine will may come and reign in every soul and bring everyone into the portals of love of the divinity in heaven and to enter, hopefully, into the centre of that sign of your divine will, to reign forevermore in that love, the Trinity, one for the other. And we want to thank Louisa for her very long, prolonged sacrifice of suffering not only the external wounds and passion of Jesus, but also the interior passion of being stigmatised in the divine will. Dear Louisa, our second mother, place your blessing upon each one of us. Assist us to understand the importance of continuous fusion and in every way be a mother to us and bring us to the fullness of that life that the eternal will of our Father wants so much for us. We call forth all the angels that surrounded Jesus' humanity on earth, the thousands upon thousands of angels, to surround our humanity and all those we love to protect us from the evil machinations of the devil particularly in this generation, and to protect all children inside the womb and outside of it from these evil ideologies that are seeking to infuse themselves into our children and our youth. And we ask, above all now at the end, to pr the protection of our beloved Saint Joseph, who was appointed in his office as guardian of all the mysteries of the Incarnation, to come and guard these mysteries and these rounds of love within us so that these divine lives may be spread throughout the world to sanctify the world and bring the kingdom on earth as in heaven. Amen. Fiat. Thank you, Gerald. That was beautiful. Wasn't that beautiful?